Great. So hello, everyone. We'll just wait uh, a few more minutes just in case uh, someone else uh, is having trouble connecting. Um, I'm going to close my emails and shall we maybe begin? Okay. <laughs> right. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, it is a great pleasure to see, uh, well, so many of you, uh, at least your names. Uh, my name is uh, Ruja Roshut, as you can tell from uh, the caption. Uh, I'm a Liberium Early Career Fellow in 18th century French uh, here at, um, at the Faculty of Medieval and Modern Languages in Oxford and a Fellow of St. Edmund Um Some of you may remember the interview that Laura Nicoli um, and I organized back in November 2020 with Alan Charles Course. Uh, professor Emeritus of Intellectual History at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, that interview focused on Paul Thierry Dolbach and his well-known uh, masterpiece, The Système de la Nature, of which 2020 marked the 250th anniversary. Uh, and it gives me uh, great pleasure actually to say that that recording um, is now uh, available on YouTube. So if you missed it, uh, yeah, you can go and watch it uh, when we are done uh, here, if you uh, so desire. Uh, now, given uh, its success, uh, I thought it would be nice to uh, turn that interview, uh, which was originally conceived as a standalone uh, event, into the first of what I hope is going to be a uh, rich and long series of lectures or um, discussions on the so-called radical enlightenment. Um, much like the interview with Professor Kors, uh, these lectures and events will be sponsored by the Lieberhulm Trust and organized in collaboration with, the, uh, uh, with TORCH, uh, so the Oxford Research Center in the Humanities. They aim to provide scholars working on the 18th century uh, with as many opportunities as possible to share and confront their ideas on, again, the so-called radical enlightenment and the figures and notions that are normally uh, connected to it, uh, trying to understand whether the label of radical enlightenment is indeed uh, one that we can work with and shedding light on some of the debates taking place in the long 18th century. Now, Professor Caroline Worman, who's here with me, with me uh, today, uh, has very kindly agreed to be our first or well, second speaker for this series. And that makes me extremely happy. Uh, so Caroline one was one of my FIVA examiners, but most importantly, it was her uh, who first introduced me to Dolbach back in 2012, uh, I think. Uh, so to the author, that is now at the heart of my research. Um, Caroline, whom I'm sure many of you uh, know, is Zaitlin Professor of French 
uh, literature and thought at Jesus College in Oxford and the president of the British Society for 18th Century Studies. I, I'm sure many of you uh, will have fond memories uh, of uh, the Isaacs conference that she organized uh, in Edinburgh back in uh, 2019, so almost exactly two years ago. Um, she's the author of a monograph on SAD, SAD from Materialism to Pornography, which appeared in the Studies on Voltaire and the 18th Century in 2002. And she's also the editor with Professor Kate Tunstall of a wonderful collection of essays by Professor Marian Hobson, um, a collection which was also published by the Voltaire Foundation uh, in 2011. Uh, the title is Hydro and Rousseau Networks of Enlightenment. Um, as many of you will know, Professor Worman is also very active, uh, a very active translator. Uh, her translation of Isabelle de Charrière's novellas uh, was published by Penguin in 2012 and was followed in 2014 by a translation uh, co-signed with uh, Professor Tunstall of a uh, of such a complex text as Diderot's uh, Neveu de Ramon. In 2016, uh, in reaction to the Charlie Hebdo attacks in Paris, uh, Professor Worman directed a collaborative translation project uh, that uh, involved more than a hundred between students and uh, tutors, uh, and that culminated uh, with the publication of an anthology of 18th century texts on religious toleration. Uh, the book is entitled Tolerance, the Beacon of the Enlightenment, and it won very prestigious prizes and awards, uh, including the Teaching Excellence Award. Now, Professor Worman's uh, latest achievement is a monograph on one of Diderot's most important and regrettably also uh, most neglected texts, the Elements de Physiologie. And it is precisely on this book, uh, the Atheist's Bible, uh, Diderot's Elements de Physiologie, uh, which only came out a few months ago, uh, that we shall focus uh, this evening. Uh, this is a very interesting book, and not just because of the ideas that it contains, which we shall discuss in just a minute. Uh, what I thought was absolutely fascinating about this book is that it is extremely uh, inclusive and, and, and reader friendly. Um, which is uh, regrettably not the norm in academic publishing. Uh, it is not just that the book was published under a Creative Commons license, meaning that the text is freely available online, although of course you can also buy uh, a print copy. Uh, it's also minor things like, I don't know, the, the, the fact that uh, quotations from French sources are always provided in both the original French and in an English translation, or the fact that whenever quoting from the Elements de Physiologie, uh, Professor Worman gives you the reference not only to the definitive edition of Hydro's complete work, so the uh, DPD or Herman edition, uh, which is amazing, but uh, also fairly costly. Uh, she also gives you the reference to all the other editions available, uh, the ones by Paolo Quintidi and uh, Motoichi Terada, meaning meaning that uh, whatever edition you have at hand, you'll always be able to find the passage you need. So in that respect, as in many others, uh, that is an innovative piece of scholarship. Uh, but now let's get started. So uh, if you don't mind, uh, Caroline, may I ask you to just give us a very short uh, two or three minute um, introduction overview of your book, just to, uh, break the ice and get the discussion going. Yeah, thank you very much, Ruggiero. And I should say that I'm not any longer the president of the 18th, the British Society of 18th Century Studies, that's Brick and Carey, who's a much better president than I am. So I just wanted to <laughs> say that. Um, yeah, thank you very much, Ruggiero. I'm glad that you like all of those references, you know, the triple references, it, you know, took me a lot of time. And I thought it was very important because I'm a nerd and obviously, you must be a nerd too. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I mean this, um, so it's, this is one book about one other book. Um, and can I just check with Jera, am I, am I um, can you hear me, am I clear? Uh, if anybody can't hear me, you know, put it in the chat or something. Um, 
So yeah, it's, it's about, about this treatise that Diderot wrote um, on the, called the Element de Physiologie. It's one of his last works. It's really a pretty substantial text and it's not very well known. And there are reasons for that, which is that it's thought to be incomplete. And also because he wasn't himself trained as a doctor, therefore it's just, it's thought to be just his reading notes and sort of of interest in a, in a sort of like roundabout footnotey sort of way. Um, and I think that's just so wrong. Um, it was unpublished during his lifetime, like many of his works. Um, there's an incomplete early draft that's in St. Petersburg that came out in 1875. There's the substantially complete draft from the Vandal um, archive that came out in 1964. So he died in 1784. So any version of this didn't really come out until um, 1875. Although um, part of the book that I've written is about how Nejon brought out a, he rewrote a version which came out in 1822. And I'll be uh, talking uh, in boring detail about that as, as or as much boring detail as Ruggiero allows me <laughs> a bit later. So my book is about this book and about its contribution to materialist thought and about why it hasn't received much attention. Um, and I look at the story about its fragmentary nature, about the fact that it's supposed to be incomplete, how that started, how it was perpetuated. I look at how Nejon, who was Diderot's literary executor, about how his plans to publish it uh, misfired really monumentally. Um, and I look also at how it seems to have been circulating in manuscript form during the French Revolution, um, finding influential readers who seem to have taken its message forward. So there's evidence that it was sent to the Comité d'instruction publique in March 1794 by somebody called the Citoyen Garon, we don't know who that is, um, and it's not recorded in their archives, it's not there anymore, it was found, or there's a trace of it in the after-death effects of somebody called Jean-Pierre Moet, who died in 1806, who was a translator, a Freemason, and a theatrical impresario. So it's partly about this sort of strange story, how did it end up there, and where is it now? Um, anybody got it actually um, and, and isn't telling us, can you please like send me an email? Um, so, um, so I look at Nejan's uh, repeated allusions to it in his plans and I also look at what I consider to be um, allusions to it and reuse of it by philosophers Gara and then the ideologue Cabanis and the Stut de Tracy. Um, and how I think that their, their philosophical project is in fact um, built around the element of physiology, I go that far. So that's, um, yeah, that's what the book's about. Right, thank you very much. Uh, so we, yeah, we, we, we'll get to Nejon and the Studio de Tracy and all the others uh, later on. But uh, what, um, you, yeah, if you don't mind, I'd actually like to start with a more kind of basic question about the element de physiology itself and uh, about the title uh, more specifically. So I, I remember that when I first came across the, the Element de Physiologie, my attention went straight to the word physiology, which is, of course, more kind of unusual than the word element. Uh, but what I learned from uh, your book is that the word element uh, is also loaded uh, with, with meaning and that it may have also had a significant impact on the way uh, that the uh, Element de Physiologie were read and received. Um, so, yeah, could, you, could I just uh, ask you to tell us something about the meaning of the word element uh, and, again, how uh, did that word um, affect the uh, reception of Diderot's texts? Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, I mean, I can, I can try. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that there's an important amount of the story around the element of physiology being fragmentary connected to this word element elements so elements i mean it's a materialist treatise so it's about the elements of matter and how the human body fits together right so that's it's a sort of materialist it's a materialist word loaded in that sense um, and i think that diderot was 
was playing with that aspect right from the very, very early versions of it. Um, so in, in 1769, he wrote the first version of the Rêve de d'Alembert, but it was not the final version, which he kept on reworking. So in 1774, um, he wrote, uh, he did a new version, which is sort of the intermediary version of the, what we now know, which he, he copied and he did it for Catherine the Great. Um, and in it, he replaced Bordeaux, uh, uh, D'Alembert and Lespinasse with, you know, somebody, a playwright, Voindin, a grammarian, Du Marseille, and then the daughter of the painter Boucher, Mademoiselle de Boucher, by Mademoiselle Boucher, I don't know why I give her a particular uh, there. Um, and so it was called Les Deux Dialogues. And at the beginning, Diderot wrote this letter of address to Catherine II saying, uh, you know, your majesty, I'm so sorry that I don't really have the proper version of this because I was obliged to destroy it because D'Alembert and Lespinas didn't like it. So this is where that story, and I think it's a story, not a reality, that's where that started. And at the end of Les Deux Dialogues, this particular version, he had a series of, um, um, of, of little bits, there's like 30 pages, fragments, and he said, these are fragments, um, and I don't know where they're supposed to go. They were from the Rêve de D'Alembert, but I've, I've lost it all now. I just have no idea. And, and, and actually, those are the beginnings. The, those are the seeds rather than the sort of shattered fragments of what has been. They're the seeds of what will be the element de physiologie. So already he's got this idea of a, of a statue and it all being sort of smashed up into little fragments. And this sort of grand nombre de pièces dont, uh, dont l'artiste ne peut reconnaître la véritable place. And I give that bit because this, this idea about the, the pièces, which somebody doesn't, can't work out the order, keeps on coming back, right? So um, a little bit later, um, some years later, there's the early draft of the actual Element de Physiologie. And we get another version of this same letter that he wrote to Catherine. Uh, the second, but it's a, so it's a new draft of it, introducing instead of the Rêve de D'Alembert with these little bits, it's in fact the early draft version of the Element de Physiologie, and it's and it has this thing again about you know sorry, you know these are just the fragments of something that it's been lost, and we can't work out where everything fits, and in the first line or the first paragraph of that first version. Uh, Diderot starts talking about nature and how you have to try and describe it, despite there being of many, many pieces where you don't know where they fit. So there's an absolute um, overlap between the avertissement, this idea of the fragments, and then the beginning of the presentation of man in nature. Um, and then, so then, um, are you with me so far? Is that all right? Yeah. yeah, okay, good, right. And then that particular avertissement, he throws it away, I don't know what he does, he just abandons it and rewrites it. So the final version, the one that's now published in these three different editions um, that I nerdily uh, cite, is the, so the, it's a new intro in which it says, Mr. Asterisk, 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 sadly died before he was able to finish this thing. He'd only just managed to assemble the materials um, and it's all in a big mess on lots of different little bits of fragments of, um, of, of paper and we put it together and we hope that one day somebody will be able to, to sort it out. Um, so you've lost, although the first paragraph again returns to this idea of nature and the chain of nature and there being links that are lost, you can't see directly the connection between the preface anymore. But what the new preface does is, while retaining the idea of shattered fragments that are in a bit of a mess, it adds some, a new layer, a new narrative layer, which seems to me to be an allusion to Pascal and his Pont de l'Epensé de Pascal, because that's exactly the story of his, of his Pensée, which is that he was assembling this amazing apologia of the Christian faith, um, which uh, he didn't have time to finish before he died, and then you know his family put it together and published it, and then that order's disputed. But of course, what he was doing, Pascal, 
in the in his posse or in his projected posse was defending the Catholic faith and uh, and also routing the atheists. So it seems as if this new aspect is Diderot saying, um, "I am now going. To, I'm 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 throwing down my gauntlet. I am challenging. Um, I'm challenging the Pascal." And I'm showing that actually it's not fragmentary, although there are bits that are missing, it's a complete whole and it's your apologia mate, which is all over the place. So it's it's got so there's these different materialist sort of ideas, I think that's where this notion of ele elements, the elements of a whole is so important. Yeah, no, so uh, I'm going to sound a bit monomaniac, but uh, I, I, I just want to uh, that yeah, so the, the word element uh, in, in, in the title uh, is also uh, in many ways, uh, I don't know, suggestive of a didactic book. Uh, so I, I, I'm thinking of uh, Voltaire's Elements de la philosophie de Newton, for example, or uh, d'Alembert's uh, Essay sur les éléments de philosophie. Uh, so is there a sense in which uh, we can uh, regard, we, we can look at the uh, Elements de physiologie, physiologie too as a didactic uh, text. Because um, yeah, I, I'm also thinking about what you say uh, at the, towards the end of your book. Uh, so about the uh, reception of uh, the Elements de Physiologie uh, in uh, lectures that were given, that were given at the Ecole Normale or yeah, in other uh, teaching institutions. Uh, so yeah, what's the connection between um, yeah, the Elements and the, and yeah, teaching so and, and yeah yeah okay so yeah thank thank you um yeah i mean i think there's two two aspects to this one connects with what i've just been talking about about links that might be missing so the element d'une science the the definition in the encyclopedie which is written by d'alembert right um that um in what d'alembert says there is you have to give an overview of what it is that you're talking about and you have to indicate what is not known right so and that is exactly what Diderot does in the element of physiology so he often says well this is what we know about whatever this particular function is and this is what we don't know so he's very close to the definition in his own encyclopedie um, of that um, and then the other aspect is that I do think that it was supposed to be um, an introductory manual to physiology, despite the fact that, you know, he wasn't trained as a doctor, but maybe, maybe he was a better writer than uh, those other, <laughs> than those other physiologists, you know, I've had, uh, spent quite a lot of time with their uh, brilliant introductions to physiology, and they are full of information that is uh, often extremely confusing and really repetitive. Um, and um, so Bordeaux, so I whom I've already mentioned, you know, because he's the one who figures, he features in the Rêve de d'Alembert as the doctor in his Recherche sur les glandes, so on researches on the glands in Came out in what 1759. He said, if only, if only we had a Leibniz or a Descartes who would come along and sort this all out for us and sort out what was it, you know, the 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 causes, the order, the relationship, the variations, the harmony, and the laws and the functions of the animal economy. Um, and I think that that's um, that that's the invitation that Diderot is responding to so he's giving a very it's a very succinct introduction to physiology it's much shorter than many at the time but it also asks lots of questions in the last bit and it does do what the others do never do which is say how the human body fits within nature as a whole so yeah it's a different sort of element does that answer the question yeah yes it does yes yeah no and um so now just moving on to the actual content of the of the element de physiologie. Uh, so to the uh, ideas that Diderot expresses uh, in this text, I was struck by the fact that uh, in the Mémoire historique et philosophique sur la vie et les ouvrages de, de, de Diderot, which you mentioned already, 
uh, Nijon defines the element of physiology as a uh, nouvelle theory, or plutôt une histoire naturelle et expérimentale de l'homme. Uh, so that, 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 that definition, uh, of course, brings to mind uh, the, uh, um, the, uh, what, what Diderot says in the Pensée sur l'interprétation de la nature about um, um, a philosophy rationale uh, versus philosophy experimental. So um, a kind of uh, more uh, synthetic uh, approach versus a more um, um, analytic, uh, yeah, uh, versus a more, um, um, so, sorry, theoretical and, and uh, th theoretical approach. Uh, so um, um, Diderot conceives of these two um, approaches as um, complementary and yet as fundamentally uh, different and independent from one another. He seems to suggest that uh, a single person, a single individual uh, could not master them both uh, perfectly. Uh, so do uh, these two approaches really coexist within the element de physiology? And if so, in, in, in what ways do, do they coexist? Oh, that's such a hard question. <laughs> I mean, uh, yes, I think pro probably. I mean, can I do something which is just say what's in each part and then try and answer the question? So the um, it falls into three parts in Image Physiology. The first part is des êtres on beings. Um, and he's looking there at um, plant, animal, human life, saying that humans have all sorts of existence, inertia, feeling, vegetable life, the life of a polyp um, and human life. And he says, l'homme est un assemblage d'animaux où chacun garde sa fonction. So the, the human being is an assemblage of animals in which each separate animal retains its function. So we were a sort of like a, 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 be, a, a sort of multiple being. And so he's, yeah, that introduction is really perhaps important at doing the bit that's both theoretical and experimental, setting that up from the beginning. Um, then the second part is this elements and parts, elements and parts of the human body. What I've said, super succinct description, very thoroughly based on Albrecht von Haller, um, but much more sort of opened up. So he asks questions, for example, what's the difference between a pair of wooden tweezers or flesh tweezers, that is to say fingers, so fingers like tweezers, right? And he says, for example, if you pull apart the wooden tweezers, they don't mind. Whereas if you pull apart the flesh tweezers, they do mind. So there's this, sort of, it's a really strange notion where you're sort of suddenly thinking about what sensation uh, means um, from a non, from a non-human perspective, while also it's quite relatable because one can think about one's fingers and, you know, not want them to be um, torn apart, you know, and he talks about there are many, many cases and illustrations which are only very briefly indicated but which add so much color so there's 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 um in the chapter on taste there's mention of a girl who's only got a stump for a tongue so she didn't really got a tongue but she still has the sense of taste so how can that be um and then there's there's a longer section as well um, which is in, in fact all lifted from somewhere else. So he's reusing it, but it has this, it's about a man, a soldier who becomes pregnant. Um, and so it sounds really lurid, but it's not lurid in the, in, it's a little bit lurid, obviously, but it's also focusing again on human experience, you know, how strange it was, how extremely strange and, and, and mystifying it was for that man who was trying to give birth but had no idea what was happening and they thought he had dropsy so it's it's so i think it's always trying to understand the yeah the theoretical aspect while looking at it through human experience and then so that's the second part part three is um the bit that then gets most reused um i, I think uh by gaha blah blah 
and it's called the phénomène du cerveau, so about the phenomena of the brain, it's about sensations, understanding, memory, imagination. Um, and um, it does, it, it, it starts thinking about what it means for this, what sort of a human being it is that we have that is being described, which is so extremely determined by their human, by their physical, fleshly incarnation that is soulless. So he's trying to, to ask the big questions um, at that point and asking whether such a person, such humans who don't have souls, which is what his argument is, um, are they devoid of, of the sublime, of mystery, of feeling or compassion? And his answer is that no, they don't. So, so I don't know whether that exactly answers your question, Ruggiero, um, but I think, um, I think maybe my answer is yes. Yeah, no, it's great to see how Peter Hall can like bring all these tiny uh, examples together and 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 yeah, turn them into a great overarching theory about human life and yeah, no, absolutely. So um, yeah, so um, I think you mentioned already uh, in in your overview that. Uh, the Elements de Physiologie were first published in 1875. Uh, but uh, again, uh, as you as you've said already, uh, in 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 fact, the, uh, the 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 text of the Elements de Physiologie appeared already uh, in Nejon's uh, Memoir sur la vie et les ouvrages de Denis Diderot, uh, which came out in 1823 as part of the Briere uh, edition of Diderot's complete works. Uh, so, could you just tell us uh, more about? Nejon's treatment of the Elements de Physiologie uh, in his memoir. So how does he select the bits and pieces that he wishes to uh, publish, to retain? And uh, well, this is a kind of related question. Uh, Nejon, uh, as, you, as you mentioned in your book, also publish, uh, publishes the um, uh, complete works of, uh, of Diho in 1798. So that's a 15 volume uh, edition. But that edition, again, uh, doesn't cover, uh, Nejon decides consciously not to publish uh, all of Diderot's works. He uh, kind of, um, he doesn't publish the, the Elements, the Rêve de D'Alembert and Le Neuve de Remont. Uh, so uh, again, uh, how does uh, Nejon uh, kind of, um, what, what, what's his approach to Diderot's uh, texts? Um. Okay, so let me take the second question first, but I attempt to not be too extraordinarily boring about it. Um, it's um, so I think that he had he had a sort of he had a worked out plan of what he was going to do, and that included a certain amount of pre advertising of what he was going to do. So you find that in um, something called the Adresse à l'Assemblée Nationale, he begins to talk about Diderot, um, begins to introduce the themes, then his Encyclopédie Méthodique, the, his article on Diderot comes out in 1792, and that begins to say, oh, there's, I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm talking about Diderot, I'm going to publish it all, and there's this one very, very important work, and I'm going to publish it really soon, and it's already, I've already written it, and you, you know, so he mentions it a lot. Um, and then, and then nothing happens, nothing happens. I mean, when I say nothing happens, obviously the Re French Revolution is happening. So that's, I mean, that's the context. It's not like he just went for a walk and forgot. It, beca it became very rapidly impossible to, um, to publish things that had any atheist tenor, right? So in 1798, by then, um, what happened? So Jacques Le Fataliste, La Religieuse, had already been published elsewhere. So he was very annoyed about that um, because he wanted to be in control. And also Babeuf um, had, had, the trial of Babeuf had taken place in which Babeuf said, my hero is Diderot. I'm, I'm not actually just joking. That's pretty much what he said. He said, Diderot is the most fiery, intrepid athlete. <laughs> of uh, anti-proprietarianism anyway so um and this didn't help um so the the it didn't help the reputation of Diderot and in fact Babeuf sorry to be so complex about this but 
Babeuf was in fact quoting the Codes de la Nature by Morelli and not Diderot, and he didn't know that. So anyway, whatever, right? So Diderot's um, um, reputation absolutely tarnished um, and, and, um, by these, by the events in various different ways. So he didn't publish anything that he thought was atheist and also he kept it separate um, because I, because he felt that it was the most important bit. Um, and then he did this thing, which is in the, 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 in the, the memoir, which he was, I think, had only really just completed in around about 1800, despite the fact that he kept on saying he'd completed it before. I think that's not true. And you can tell that from the references that he makes in it was going to publish it and then wasn't wasn't able and obviously I give you a blow by blow account of Mijon's uh, unfortunate life and why it was he wasn't able to publish it what we do but anyway he died in 1810 having still not published it and it came out as we say in the Briere edition and there what we discover is that what he did with the Rete d'Alembert and the um and the, yeah, I'm just rolling my eyes at him, and the element de physiologie is cut them up and reassemble them under the title in the book, in the memoir, so Diderot, that you gave, you know, it was his, you know, Histoire naturelle expérimentale de l'homme. Um, and he says, you know, Diderot said to me one day, and that's how the, um, the quotation begins. So the book, Nejean's let me just hold it up because it'll be a bit easier. This is his mem memoir. Is that that long? Is that making sense? That's a bit of show and tell. See, loads of pages, loads and loads of pages. Um, um, and of that, about um, a fifth of it is this reassembled work. Um, and so there's 80 pages of re-knitted. I mean, it's, it's incessant quotation that's reorganized. Um, I'll be able to show you what I mean in a second. Um, um, and it's and about 50, so it's about 50 pages contains the Elements de Physiologie and 30 pages contains the Herte d'Alembert, but they're not separate. They're not properly named. They're not accurately quoted. Um, or at least they are accurately quoted, but they're quoted in a decontextualized way. So he's meshed them. And why did why did he why did he do this? I mean, okay, so I don't know. Um, I don't know, but I I think from having read uh, now pretty much most of his oeuvre that he was a very high-minded person. And he wanted everything to be very, very serious. He was extremely aware that Diderot as a writer was really explosive in two ways. One, because he was at points obscene and, and the other because he was atheist. So what Nejon decided, and that's, I, I don't know whether it's because he wanted to or because he felt it was a good strategy or both, is he got rid of the, what he deemed to be the obscene Diderot and turned it into a serious atheist, turned him into a serious atheist writer. And so he tried to write a treatise that was really serious. And he writes quite a lot. There was um, a preface to the first published edition of Montaigne's essay in the Exemplaire de Bordeaux. Um, and so Nejean was the editor of that. Um, and he wrote a long preface, which was then censored, in which he it talked about what the work of a really good editor was. And it's about correcting and perfecting the text of the author. And that the author was grateful. The author of taste would be grateful. And so you read it and you go, ne, ne, jean, ne jean. But anyway, um, so that's what that's what that's what he did. He, he read it and he did it. He so he's and what has how has he done it? He's I mean, he's, I think he made, he used a lot of cards, um, I was going to say like these, these sorts of things, I think, um, with, you know, particular thematic titles, and then wrote lots of quotes down, and then gave them all, that's what I think he did, so it's thematically organised, it's extremely repetitive, um, he removes 
certainly from the from the uh, the Red de d'Alembert, all of the dialogue, and he certainly removes Lespinas. Um, he removes any of the rude stuff, certainly, and he keeps the atheism, which he then ramps up a bit. So that's what he does. It's quite an odd. It's honestly quite an odd amalgam that is produced. But somebody called, um, who many of you know, maybe he's even here, but I can't tell. But so John O'Brien, who's a great specialist of, of, of 16th century writer Montaigne and La Boissy, he said this sort of republication of snippets in a new, a new re-snippeted version was quite common amongst erudite, early modern erudite publishing. So that's something that I haven't followed up yet, but I thought that was a useful sort of way of thinking about it. Gets Nejan off the hook a bit. Should we actually just uh, look at this? You know, uh, sh 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 should we actually look at the, the edition itself and see how the Rêve de d'Alembert and the uh, Element de Physiology uh, are linked in, in, uh, in Nejan's memoir? So, uh, I, I should mention uh, that, uh, the, that, that the book, uh, so Caroline's book, comes, of course, with uh, an edition of uh, Nejan's Memoir sur la vie et les ouvrages des libraux, uh, the, the section that is devoted precisely to the uh, Elements de Physiologie and the uh, Rêve de Dallander. So, well, si since we are on, on, on the subject, what sh sh should we just proceed and uh, have a look at the, at the edition itself? Let's. You can tell we did. We prepared this before, boys and girls. Um, okay, so let me show you. Okay, um, Ruggiero, is that, is that the right thing? Yes, that's perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so this is the home page. Obviously, a very interesting, nice picture. Blah blah. You can scroll down, and it explains um, what it is that I've done. I've got it in English on the left, and in French on the right, basically. Um, and then the key bit is here. So this is like the recipe about how to do it. So so it's, um, you start with the Nejo's Memoir sur Diderot, which up here, the cursor, and then you can see which is the Element de Physiologie, which is in yellow, or the Rêve de D'Alembert in green. So then you can hover over a quotation and then find out the origin and then also on the left, you'll see a side menu. So I'm going to show you that as well, where um, where I've got the bits that are censored from the from the memoir because I went to have a look at the manuscript, which is um, in the Bibliothèque Carnegie Carnegie Library de Reims. So let me show you. So it starts. So this bit I haven't. You know, it's not a complete edition of the entire book it's just the like 90 pages where Nejo is is quoting or not just quoting is reusing um the Rêve de d'Alembert and the and Nejo so I'm just going to scroll down a bit and try and do it slowly so you don't actually get seasick so <laughs> Joe is going to tell me if you start if it starts looking if it starts being seasick okay, so this is this is where it starts yeah so l'absurdité palpable La distinction des deux substances de l'homme dans l'homme. So that's from that's from the Elements de Physiologie, and so this is the new bit of the net, the extra layer of nerdiness, actually sort of important, which is so EPSP the one on the left. That's the Saint Petersburg version, which is the early draft, and the one on the right is the late is the Vandal version. Um, and I haven't given the Quintilly one there, so it's only the DPV version. Uh, uh, if I do that, you can see, um, and I put like, this is an illusion rather than a direct quote. <laughs> um, so um, yeah, and the reason that it's important to have both EP, so the, S, the St. Petersburg version and the Vondel version is um, so that we know, or we can see, whether Nejon, which version Nejon is using. So my, my conclusion, my learned conclusion is that he's using both of them. Um, anyway, so green, here we are. So the Rêve de d'Alembert, page 92, it's d'Alembert who's speaking. You see what he's doing? 
So there, so what he does with the Hefta Dalamba is he often, what he does is he comes from similar pages um, and he just takes out, he turns it into sort of didactic prose and he removes the, yeah, so these bits here is perhaps easier to see. So he just removes the dialogue. So it's all from nine, page 92 there, right? And then, and then he adds this bit here. So this is Dita Horace speaking himself. Um, right, so now I'm gonna go down a little bit further. So this is, yeah, the, so this is the suite de l'entretien. So that's all Rêve de d'Alembert. So then he starts saying here, do you see this? Le second dialogue est beaucoup plus varié, plus profond que le premier. Second dialogue is much more varied and deeper or profound than the first. So this is where he starts quoting from the Elements de Physiologie, although he says, il est intitulé le rêve de d'Alembert. Yeah. Um, so there we are. So he starts here, the Elements de Physiologie, and then this is a footnote. So you can, you can begin to see, I don't know, sorry, are you getting, feeling seasick? Look, so this bit, let's just take the um, St. Petersburg version on the left, three, three, page 308, 167, 313. So he really is jumping around. And then this one, this bit here, 314, and this bit here, 314. So, the, so then, um, yeah, let me not be too excessively nerdy, it's boring. Right, um, let me go down further. I want to go down to page 224, but you can see, so here, quite a bit of Elements Physiology, just a little bit of the Head de D'Alembert, but it's getting more exciting, don't worry. Um, so we are lots more Elements Physiology, you can begin to see that, can't you? Um, um, so yeah, so Sentir, c'est vivre, so that's very early on, and it's something that's also quoted by Cabanis and Gustave de Tracy. Um, and here we go. So there's lots there. The reason that I wanted to show this bit here is that it comes from a very early bit, and it's this chaîne. Il y a une chaîne d'être qui passe de l'état de stupidité vivante jusqu'à l'état d'extrême intelligence. It was interesting to show you that the this idea of the chain and the chain of being and how it's organized, and that there might be these links, les chaînons. That are, that, are, that are missing. Um, so this is, uh, anyway, so yeah, not stop comment, commenting, Caroline. Right, so yeah, I wanna go down to page two, five, six, let me just, so we just, I mean, you can see how much there is, right? And, and every single, it's from all over the place. You can see, so each bit that's a separate chunk comes from different places. So you can see here, I, it seems as if he's using the St. Petersburg version because it doesn't appear to this bit, it doesn't appear to be in the Vendel version. Um, and, but there are other places where he clearly is. So that's, you know, there you are, he's using both. Um, right, 256. So there's mixture again. Um, is anybody bored yet? Um, Right, yeah. So I wanted to, yeah, again, show you this idea of the of the of the chenon. Um, so the, and here he's talking. So you, this is the super famous, wonderful soliloquy of 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 of, of D'Alembert. Pourquoi suis-je tel? Parce qu'il a fallu que je suis tel. And he does. So this is a bit where Nejon does keep the fictional sort of framework. <laughs> adds a bit. So Lespinas and Bordeaux, it says, they hear D'Alembert sort of fiddling with his curtains. And then he carries on. But the bit about the curtains is not in any of Diderot's own versions of the of the Hef de D'Alembert, not that I can find it. Um, so I thought that was funny, uh, Nejean attempting to be fictional. Right, so let me just show you one more bit I'm from here. Um, um yeah it's just to show how interwoven it is but i'm sure you've already got the point there and it's impossible to to read while i'm fiddling around um with the text let me just show you the sense some of the censored bits right and then i'll um release you from this um vertigo. um so 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 yeah so there are quite a few censored passages um and they're all you can see that you can find them in the manuscript because they've always got this funny little sign 
on the side. So some of them don't. So that's why I've put here, there is no sensor sign. Um, but all of them relate to um, anti-clericism, of anti-clericalism, what's the word, of one sort or another. Um, so it's Briere has taken them out and he signals them in the, um, in the, in the margins. Um, and from the bit that I'm interested in particularly, so that is to say the 90 pages with the, this mesh of the Head de d'Alembert and the Element of Physiologie, there are only three little bits that are removed, which is in, its, in itself interesting. And I shall, yeah, I'm quite interested in, in why that is, and I'm not really sure what the answer, why that should be. But so let me go uh, down to it. Um, so which is the bit that I wanted to show you. Um, I can't find the, hang on, let me just, there's a bit, I want to show you an image, actually, there we go, of the, of the manuscript itself. Sorry. Okay, here we are. So this is from our, our section, as it were. So Nejo is quoting the Elements Physiologie, Briere dilutes the attack on religion and amends the Diderot text. So the bit, so in, is in bold that has been removed. So this is, you know, not very exciting. It's just to show you. So this is the, the, the manuscript. It's not Nejan's handwriting, it's his, his brother's handwriting. So you can see there this, this little thing that the, um, the editor has added, you see. So, quel éloge peut-on tirer de là en faveur du prétendu créateur? So that's the bit that then gets um removed here's a bit a russian bit which is quite fun um so it's down here in the footnote c'est à petersburg et chez un de ses esclaves titre one of these in one of these titled slaves that in all of all courts everywhere we call or are called great lord okay so that bit that little bit of sarcasm is removed. So there's not very much, it's absolutely tiny, really. Um, and then there's one, so there, there tend to be, well, you can see sort of relatively small, except for at the end, there's, it's about 6,000 words. Um, and I think it's, yeah, it's this, it's this bit. So I'll sort of, sort of go through it, sort of click through it so you can just sort of see how much <laughs> Nejon wrote here about the awfulness of the church and, and yeah anyway I mean that's what he that's that was his particular um, thing and it was all cut okay so I think I'm going to stop sharing yeah. thank you for your yeah, no, thank, thank, thank you for uh, yeah for showing that, that the edition that 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 was brilliant uh, so uh, I've got one more question and then we can we can open the floor and that's just about the, uh, uh, again, going, going back to the uh, idea of, uh, you know, um, a radical enlightenment. Uh, so do you, uh, to, to what extent do you think that the Element de Physiologie can actually be regarded as a radical text? I mean, you, you were talking before about the similarities between the uh, Element de Physiologie and Pascal's Pensée um is there more that yet yeah, is there more to say about the uh yeah how, how does uh the Diderot's text fit within the kind of traditional notion of radical enlightenment um i think the thing that's really radical about, I think, so I think it does, I think you can use that word, it's appropriate to use it. Um, the thing that's radical about it is its explicit materialism from line one. It says human beings are part of nature and then, it, and, and then it starts talking about sensibility, so feeling and it looks at a stone and it looks at a polyp and so it's abs and then it goes up to humans and then it goes back down again and it's endlessly crossing. So, you know, it's talking about 
uh, I mean, I know I quoted this before about, but a human being and a, an assemblage of animals, you know, a group of animals all connected together. I mean, we all probably do know the amazing bit from the Rêve de D'Alembert with the, the swarm of bees. And that, but it's that, but uh, more explicit and, and more direct, I suppose I'm just being tautologous there, but it's, um, so it's the, that's the thing that's different. And I've got this, uh, I've got this very long <laughs> sort of chapter about, about the philosophy and where it fits in and where, where his philosophy is coming from. And it seems to me that there's, there's been this conversation going on about, about nature and matter at the time at which he writes for at least 150 years. But they and, and but the little the little sort of it, they themselves are little snippets found here and there, um, and that don't dare to be really open apart from like you know, something like Melier, for example, um, and that Diderot sews it all together. So he uses the philosophy, he uses the zoology, he uses the natural history, and he brings it all together and says, "This is nature. This is man in nature. Soul." is the sort of like imbecility and and that's the bit that's unacceptable is simply the the atheist exploration of the human condition yeah. that's pretty radical I, I agree but right so uh, at this point the floor is open so if anyone would like to ask any questions uh you've got actually two options i, uh, I, I i'm told so you can either write your question in the chat box or in the Q&A. Um, and I'll see if I can uh, read them for you. So I, I think we may have two questions already in the Q&A. Uh, so yeah, we, we can start from these. And then again, uh, yeah, do, do post more questions uh, if, you, if you'd like to. So uh, we've got a question uh, that says, well, I'm, I'm just going to read it. So uh, I, uh, sorry, that, that, that's not a real question. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> so, uh, Gerhard Stenger uh, is asking, Bonjour, uh, j'ai reconnu dans l'ouvrage de Néjon un passage d'une lettre à Madame des Mots de 1769, uh, intercalé entre des fra fra uh, fragments des éléments de, du, et, et du rêve à propos des germes préexistants. Uh, Est-ce que vous comptez traiter également ces passages extérieurs aux éléments et aux rêves? Um, thank, thank you, thank you very much um, for that for that question, and thank you also for being here. Um, so, so um, yes, um, the, and and in fact, so the the um, the the online edition, the sort of digital version of Nejan's mémoire, is incomplete. Um, and I don't wish to be, um, as it were, in charge of it. I've started it off and I want to try and do more and add more, um, but I'd be delighted um, to have other collaborators if this is a useful thing that we could all share. Um, so I haven't done that bit yet, but in the um, Adresse à l'Assemblée Nationale, from 1790, for example, there's loads of these letters to Madame de Maux um, that Diderot, I'm sorry, that Nejan uses, um, and he does mesh it all up. So that's, I mean, a really, I mean, as you as you know better than I do, um, a very important um, source um, for him. So yes, in the future, absolutely. But I need to need to get some more money and have some more friends uh, to do it with me. Will you be one of them? And <laughs> Is there a plan to translate the element uh, into English as well? Yes, yes. Well, I mean, I mean, I've already done quite something like fifteen thousand words as part of the book itself, which you know you mentioned yeah. that I've given a lot of translations. So that together is about fifteen thousand words. But there's a lot more that I need to that I need to do. And yeah, I do, I do need to do that. But there's been this pesky pandemic, and everything's been, you know, it's all very difficult. Uh, another question yet yeah, by JP Shank. Uh, so I'm just going to read it aloud. Uh, wonderful 
what wonderful project, Caroline, and I'm looking forward to using the book in the following my teaching. My question is broad and sort of naive, but I'd, I'd really like to hear your answer to it, uh, given your broad expertise with Igor Zav. Uh, why do you think uh, Igor chose not to publish Les Rêves, uh, Les Neveux, and Les Elements, and maybe other works? What, in your mind, is his relationship to the publishing of books, and how do you explain his choice not to publish so much? Oh, hi, JB. Um, yeah, I mean, I wish, um, I wish that, um, I mean, I really think that Kate Tunstall is the person to answer this question. So the, 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 my response is going to go through her work, um, partly in the, on the Lecture Les Avergles, but elsewhere as well. Um, so, I mean, I think that that, I mean, the basic promise that Didor made to the authorities not to publish anything that would uh, endanger public morals or whatever the phrase was, you know, when he was in, in prison in Vincennes in 1749, I think he kept that promise. Um, and um, I mean, it's not as if, I mean, you know this better than I do, but it's not as if the encyclopédie was easy to get published. And obviously it, its publication was halted. Um, so I think that it, I mean, yeah, I mean, so he just simply stopped publishing a certain sort of thing while publishing. So this is me and this is not, not Kate. I don't know whether she would agree, but it's, I think that what he's publishing is the, vir the virtuous Diderot stuff. So the, um, the Fils Naturel and those sorts of things. It's like me, Diderot, I'm very, very virtuous. So, um, and perhaps the, pense, the you know, the, the pensée sur les, sur l'interprétation de la nature is going in that sort of difficult direction, but it's still, it's very gnomic, it's very tight, so you can't really attack it. Um, um, and, and of course, the answer is he did publish Le Rêve de D'Alembert, right, didn't he, through the correspondence littéraire. So this manuscript publication was possible and was happening. So, I mean, if he, if he, Diderot, was writing in the correspondence littéraire and that was going to Catherine II and then the various other, you know, elevated readers, um, then, um, then it was getting out there. But Le Neuve de Rameau and Les Elements de Physiologie are the two, the two of his works, the only ones that were not published in the correspondence littéraire, correspondence littéraire either. So I think... I mean, I, I suppose I have to say what I think Marion Hobson would say, if she's here, but she might be, um, which is that he he wanted to hold on to them. He thought they were too um, too dangerous and would endanger his family if published during his lifetime, um, and that he was handing them on to posterity. You know, you know those letters to Falconer all about posterity. Um, so I suppose that's where that's how I would put that. I mean, so just one tiny extra thing, I'll shut up. But I mean, and Ruggiero knows this on his work on the système de la nature. Dolbach, maybe, just can get away with publishing something like that under somebody else's name. He's protected, he's a German, but he's in, in France, he's super rich, he can do it. But Diderot can't do it. Um, so, so I, yeah, I, I think it's just to do with that. No? Question mark? Got one more question by Marion, Marion Upson. So uh, uh, she writes, I should like to know whether uh, is uh, whether there is any sense uh, of a group around the composing and, and then the struggles around the actual publications, uh, doctors, the group around the ad, ad, ad administration of the uh, of the Yes. Um, I mean, I think that yeah, I think that's a really interesting question. I, my feeling is that there, but I, my feeling is that there isn't a group around the composition of the Elemente Physiologie in its different versions. Maybe you know differently. I feel that, I just feel like his plume, his style is so his that he's assembling stuff and writing it. Um, but once we get into the 1790s, I think there's absolutely a group um, and I'd like to look more into that and understand it better. You know, is, is Gara, is he le citoyen Garon? Um, is, is Gara, have Gara and Cabanis 
and this de Tracy, have they talked about it? Have they decided what to do? Are they talking to Nejon? You know, I, and I, I think they might be, you know, that, you know, the typical understanding is that Nejon and the ideologue were not, didn't like each other, but I, I their, their, their tactic about um, slamming Condillac and then quoting Diderot without saying so is exactly the same. So I can't think that they weren't working together, but that stuff is so hard to trace to sit there and just speculate. And it's sort of, it's hard for a nerd to speculate so much. You want some evidence. So, you know, that's where I go through all of the, um, just quotation, where are the quotation um, sort of echoes um, to try and do it that way. But it's, I mean, it's a limited approach, I think. What do you think I should do? Yes, sorry, going back to the uh, digital edition that you showed us uh, before, uh, it's actually striking that just visually that the, that the text is completely different from, from the text that, well, I know from the uh, DPV edition, for example, right? So in the DPV edition, the, the structure itself of the text, I mean, the, the text is very fragmentary. So you've got a line and then uh, a second line, which is kind of detached from the rest. So you, you don't get really long paragraphs, but what uh, Nejon seems to be doing is to kind of collapse everything together. And um, yeah, so it, it, it uh, yeah. I, what, what, what does that, that, what does that tell us, I guess, about, about the, uh, about Nejon's, uh, yeah, approach again to the uh, element of theology uh, because it makes it look more sustained, don't mm. you think? Whereas the DPV, it, I, mean, I, have, I, have, I have got it, but I haven't got it in front of me, but it's, but you're right, they, they, there's like huge amounts of textual space. It actually physicalizes, it manifests this notion that it's fragmentary, makes it look fragmentary. Whereas mm. if it's all it's sort of smashed together in a great big paragraph, it looks more sustained. Although actually, you know, it is bouncing about. Um, in different ways. Yeah. Right. Uh, if there are no additional questions, uh, I, I, I don't see any any more questions in the chat box or in the Q and A. Uh, so, well, in that in that case, uh, I'm just gonna say, well, thank you very much to Caroline for, uh, you know, this, this wonderful presentation. And thanks to uh, all the people at Torch. So uh, Sarah Clay, Sarah Babb, uh, Victoria McInnes and Professor Wes Williams, who all helped uh, with the organization of this, this event. And uh, hopefully again, there will be a, uh, well, a second or a third lecture at some point in uh, November, uh, but uh, I'll send uh, the details uh, later on. So. Uh, thank you very much uh, again, Caroline. Um, and uh, well, uh, see, 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 see you soon, uh, everyone. Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Really kind. Thank you. Thank you.